colleagues from the media, good afternoon. And welcome back to weekly press briefing from the Presidential Palace in Jakarta. A COVID-19 safe, productive society was recently brought up. Health consideration, for sure, remains the top priority of the government. But at the same time, we are entering the new normal, a new normal, something that inevitable. Recommendation from experts and scientists, as well as credible data, will guide us to prepare the new normal. So within this context, I'm very pleased to have Minister Suharso Monoarfa, the Minister of National Development Planning, and he will share with you about a COVID-19 safe, productive society. Professor Wiku Anisasmita will respond questions related to detailed data on COVID-19. Colleagues, let me start by updating you on the status of Indonesian returning. In total, as of yesterday, more than 100,000 Indonesian, to be more exact, 103,774 has returned home, an increase of 4,676 in just a week. Between 18 March until 27 May 2020, 79,046 Indonesian have returned home from Malaysia. This is an increase of 2,510 compared to the previous week. Meanwhile, 18,256 Indonesian crews have returned so far from 23 countries, arriving in Indonesia through dedicated entry points in Jakarta and Bali. And this is an increase of 1,302 compared to last week. And 6,472 Indonesian have returned home via self-repatriation from 33 countries. And this is an increase of 864 compared to the previous week. At the same time, we continue to extend assistance to Indonesian abroad who are badly affected by COVID-19 and its relevant restriction. Between 18 March until 27 of May, in Malaysia alone, our embassies and Consulate General have distributed 266,388 packages of basic needs. And with the help of the Indonesian diaspora, we managed to provide 375,556 packages. And this brings our total assistance globally to 428,873 packages. Of course, this includes Middle East area, Asia Pacific, Europe, America, and Africa. Colleagues, to ensure more health protection for the Indonesian returnee, their family, and the society, the Minister of Health of Indonesia circulated a letter number 338 on the 22nd of May 2020. This circular letter is in addition to the previous circular letter number 313-313 of 7 May 2020. One thing that was added in the new circulation letter of the Minister of Health was among others the option to conduct mandatory 
quarantine in hotels. So this is self-funded by the returnees. As an alternative to quarantine facilities provided by the government. In this regard, the National COVID-19 Task Force have recommended seven hotels for self-funded quarantine facilities in Jakarta. Another important development that I would like to share with you today is that one Indonesia company has just obtained ISO certification 16604 class 3 to produce personal protective equipment. What does it mean? It means that Indonesia will soon be able to produce high standard PPEs both for domestic needs as well as for others. Colleagues from the media, let me now share with you my engagement with my foreign minister counterpart during the last one week. My number one engagement was on 8 all feeder. I exchanged Hari Raya greetings, among others with foreign minister of Singapore, Brunei, Malaysia, Turkey, Egypt, Jordan, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Secretary General of the OIC. My number two engagement is on the Palestine issue. Colleagues, the position of Indonesia on the Palestine issue remains unchanged. Indonesia is one of the strongest supporters of Palestine. Indonesia is very concerned on the plan of Israel to annex the Palestinian territory in the West Bank. Within this context, I had written to many foreign ministers and international dignitaries, including to the UN Secretary General, Foreign Minister of Palestine, Foreign Ministers of Members of UN Security Councils, a number of foreign ministers from OIC member countries, from non-aligned movement, foreign minister uh, from the AU, and the international organization. I brought the issue of Palestine to their attention again. In the letter, I mentioned among others that the annexation does not only threaten peace and stability in the region, but also undermine all efforts to reach a lasting political solution on the Palestinian issue based on two-state solution and call for the international community to work together to uphold international consensus on the issue of Palestine to achieve a lasting peace where two sovereign and democratic state Palestine and Israel could live in peaceful coexistence. In addition, I convey a high call to the international community to work together to uphold our commitment, international parameters and consensus, again to find long-lasting solution on the future state of Palestine. On top of the two engagements, that is on the eight outfitter as well as on the Palestine, yesterday, I also received a phone call from Secretary Pompeo of the United States of America. I brought three issues with Secretary Pompeo. First is on Afghanistan. I convey my appreciation on U.S. contribution in bringing peace in Afghanistan. I welcome the agreement between political leaders in Afghanistan as well as the ceasefire between the Afghan government with Taliban. Together with Germany, Norway, Qatar, and Uzbekistan, 
Indonesia issued a joint statement on ceasefire in Afghanistan on the 24th May 2020. I reiterated the commitment of Indonesia toward peace in Afghanistan. My second issues that I discuss uh, with Secretary Pompeo is on the cooperation to fight COVID-19, including possible long-term cooperation for medicine and vaccine. My third point is on the Palestine issue. I reiterated that Indonesian position remain unchanged on the Palestine issue. And I hope for the U.S. leadership in preventing the plan of Israel to further annex the West Bank from happening. And before the Eid celebration, I also discussed the issue of Palestine with Foreign Minister of Canada and Foreign Minister of Ireland. Colleagues, finally, I would like to share with you on the UN Security Council meeting. Last night, I participated in the UN Security Council open video teleconference on the protection of civilians in armed conflict under the presidency of Estonia. President of Estonia, Secretary General of the UN, President of ICRC, Nobel Peace Laureate Alan Johnson Sirlea, Foreign or State Minister from Estonia, St. Vincent and Grenadines, Tunisia, UK and Germany participated in the meeting together with all members of the UN Security Council. Colleagues, last year, Indonesia presided over the open debate commemorating the 20th anniversary of the protection of civilian agenda and the 70th anniversary of Geneva Convention. Indonesia message then remains relevant during this COVID-19 pandemic. The UN Security Council must continue exercising its moral weight to protect civilians in armed conflict. In the, meeting, the, in the meeting last night, I stressed that various conflicts still occur in many countries amidst this pandemic. This is not only complicates our effort to protect civilians, it also gives an extra burden for the people in conflict-affected countries due to COVID-19. In fact, violent attacks have increased by 37% between mid-March and mid-April in sub-Saharan Africa. And furthermore, armed conflicts have displaced more than 661,000 people in the last two months. Against this backdrop, in the council meeting last night, I convey three key messages. The first message, the importance of a humanitarian pause. COVID-19 provides a momentum to stop the fighting and lay down weapons, including in Afghanistan. And this is in line with the Secretary General uh, appeal, the UN Secretary General appeal for immediate global ceasefire during the pandemic, which Indonesia strongly supports. Second message, the need to ensure compliance with international humanitarian law at all times. I underline the situation in Palestine where compliance to the international humanitarian law is desperately needed now as annexation and COVID-19 have struck them at once. The world and the council are indebted to restore the Palestinian right over its territory in line with 1967 border. 
now we must not let further annexation to happen. My third message during the UNSC meeting last night is on the significance to place women empowerment at the heart of protection of civilians. I underline that local communities, particularly women, must become part and parcel of the development and implementation of protection of civilian strategy. I have repeatedly underlined Indonesia's message on women, peace and security on many occasions, and I will continue to do so in the future. So colleagues, that is all from me. Now I would like to invite Minister Monoarfa to convey some updates on a COVID-19 safe, productive society. Minister Monarfa, the floor is yours and thank you very much. Thank you, Ibu Ratno, Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia, uh, colleagues of media, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. Indeed, the COVID-19 pandemic is a wake-up call for the world, including Indonesia, on how vulnerable we are to the pandemic and that we have to act swiftly to minimize its impact on our health and as well as economy. All of us are now focused on how to contain the virus and flatten the infection curve as soon as possible. Although there is no one size fits all formula, however Indonesia is constantly learning from success story from countries that have managed to contain the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of the lessons learned are the use of data and science as the basis of, for decision making. Restriction of people movement are carried out through several phases and rules. And the last one is the implementation of health protocols has to be guided has to be guarded with a discipline by people and strict supervision. And the relaxation of people movement restriction should be revisited and reapplied if the protocols are not there. Referring to the WHO recommendation, reviewing large scale social restriction, PSPP, must be based on at least three criteria, which are epidemiology, health system, and surveillance. Therefore, Indonesia is now standing strictly on the three criteria recommended by WHO before making decision on relaxing, on relaxing the PSDB. It is important to note that those criteria are not independent of each other, but they are interlinked and must be taken into account simultaneously. Allow me to brief you on this criteria that Indonesia adopt. First is epidemiology. This criterion is based on effective reproduction number, which describes how fast the virus is transmitting. It tells the average of number of people who are infected by a single infectious person. When RT is equal to 2.5, it means that one infected person can transmit the virus 
to two, three other people. Bapena says calculator at the for province, district, and cities in Indonesia by using an international standardized methodology of calculation. <coughs> This method has also been adopted in the United States and its 54 states as well as the UK and the Germany. For your information, effective reproduction number is highly affected by physical distancing measure. A study in the UK found that a 74% reduction in the average daily contact can reduce reproduction number from 2.6 to 2.62. The second criterion is the capacity of healthcare system for treating COVID patients. This is indicated by the minimum number of hospital beds available for COVID which should exceed 20% of average new cases within the last 14 days. For example, if the average number of daily, news, daily new cases in, is 100, then the number of hospital beds should be made available for COVID at least 120 beds. Aside from this, it is also recommended to provide sufficient number of ICUs and isolation rooms, personal protective equipment, as well as medical staff. The third criterion is surveillance capacity. On these surveillance measures, WHO recommends countries to undertake a weekly test of one person within every 1,000 people per week, meaning that Indonesia essentially needs to implement COVID tests as many as 270,000 tests per week. Even so, the required number of tests can be rationalized to the condition and needs of Indonesia. For example, Jakarta itself has undertaken 132,000 tests, which means 50% of the required tests have been implemented in Jakarta area. However, understanding the importance of surveillance measures, Indonesia has to pursue more tests by increasing the laboratory capacity and people awareness to undertake self-initiated COVID tests. We do understand the difficulty to impose restriction to the fullest extent, while every country, Indonesia included, has to keep the wheels of the economic running. In Indonesia case, our economy has been struggling during this outbreak. Economic growth in the first quarter of 2020 was only at 2.97%. To cope with this situation, we need to enter a new normal at least until the vaccine and medicine are available or until COVID can be suppressed to a significant low level. We also have to ensure that the health protocols are implemented with strict discipline in all daily social activities, so-called the new normal. The new normal means COVID-19 protocols have to be rigorously imposed. Management and authorities in crowded places have to ensure sufficient and washing facilities, sufficient hand washing facilities, minimizing physical interaction, avoiding formation of crowds, independent case reporting, and social controls. On the other side, regular monitoring of effective reproductive number is mandatory to monitor the spread of the virus in reviewing the, rel the relaxation policy possibility policy of PSBB. In this context, Bapenas has developed a dashboard of RT for provinces and districts in Indonesia, publicly available at covid.bapenas.go.id. Who do believe that the virus containment needs a high-level discipline 
by the people to implement COVID protocols. The virus containment, containment will not be successful without strong support from communities and the society as a whole in their daily activities. Our next challenge is to induce contactless society and cashless society <coughs> to accelerate the virus containment in Indonesia, for example, in South, uh, other countries have undertaken this measure, for example, in South Korea, where robotic and digital technology are widely used to reduce contact among people, while in Japan, its government has released 10 measures for reducing social contact, such as encouraging online shopping, wearing masks, and working from home except for essential services. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Minister Monoarfa. Colleagues, uh, let us now proceed to the uh, Q&A uh, session. And we have received questions from 10 medias. Uh, Sky News, Sydney Morning Herald, CCTV, Channel News Asia, Taiwan News Agency, Nikkei, ABC, Anadolu Agency, Mainichi Simbun, and Kyodo News. For sure, Minister Monarfa will answer related, a question related to a COVID-19 safe productive society, while Professor Viku will provide updates on technical data and other details. So let me start by responding the question from Nikkei on whether ASEAN Leaders Summit can be held as scheduled in June. The 36th ASEAN Leaders Summit at the end of June or scheduled uh, to take place in end of June uh, to 2020 is for sure an important meeting for ASEAN. So consultation among all ASEAN member states are currently taking place. The decision of course will depend on the situation of COVID-19 at the time. Indonesia and ASEAN member states will work in close coordination with Vietnam as current ASEAN chair. On the question by Anadolu Agency on the result of recent phone call between President Jokowi and President Erdogan during the 8th of Peter, in the phone call, President Jokowi exchanged greetings with President Erdogan on the celebration of Eid al Fitr. They also discussed about the new normal and how to be productive while being safe from COVID-19. Both also discussed economic recovery and the importance to further strengthen international cooperation in this matter. My next response is for CNA on their question about whether Indonesian authorities have held discussion with neighboring countries to establish a travel bubble and its arrangement. Colleagues, this morning, President Jokowi held a cabinet meeting on issues related to preparation of COVID safe tourism. During the meeting, President Jokowi underlined two important points. The first point is that the preparation is needed. That's like other countries are preparing everything now. But the second, it must be thorough, detailed, and safe to ensure the health and safety of the people. So then again, the health and the safety of the people remains top priority. 
the discussion is still on the preparation stage and we have yet to decide on the time frame. My last response is for Sydney Morning Herald, uh, who said that I suggested, who said that I suggested that the push for the, an inquiry of the origin of COVID-19 was being politicized by Australia, and how is the aid political? How is it political to find out how this global pandemic started, and? If it is political, why did Indonesia subsequently back the resolution for an investigation? Has Indonesian government received additional aid and assistance guarantee from China and Britain? So, colleague, I understand that I mentioned this issue on my last week briefing, in which I addressed the resolution of WHA73 on COVID-19 response. But let me repeat what I said last week, 20 May 2020, on the WHA73 resolution. And I quote, I quote, for Indonesia, WHA73 has a strategic importance amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. The convening of the WHA 73 has demonstrated the global commitment to strengthen unity and solidarity to fight against COVID-19. And equally important, to better prepare for future pandemics and strengthen global health governments. Therefore, since the very beginning of the preparation of the meeting, Indonesia has been very consistent to encourage all members on the importance of cooperation among countries to set aside differences and not to politicize the meeting as well as its issues. Therefore, Indonesia decided to co-sponsor the draft resolution on COVID-19 response. This draft resolution was adopted on the 19th of May and co-sponsored by 135 countries. There is no single mentioning about investigation in the resolution of WHA 73 on COVID-19 response. What is clear, there will be a comprehensive evaluation to review experience gain and lesson learned from the WHO coordinated international health response to COVID-19, as well as in the strengthening of global health governance going forward, which is supported by WHO and this resolution was co-sponsored by 135 countries including Brazil, Russia, Japan, the Republic of Korea, Australia and China and it was also welcomed by DG of WHO. Unquote. So hopefully when I repeat this statement of my last week briefing, it gives you clear picture to respond your question. And then to respond the question by Nikkei on the update of the situation of Indonesian crews in the Chinese visiting vessel and how the Chinese government responded to Indonesia latest diplomatic note. For your information or to update you, Indonesian government is very committed, again, on the protection of the Indonesian national. You know that this is one of the top priorities of Indonesian foreign policy. In regard to the follow-up of mistreatment encountered by the Indonesian crews working at the Chinese visiting vessel, as I mentioned before, we have two priorities. 
Priority number one is fulfilling the right of the cruise. Second priority is conducting investigation or legal effort at national level and with the Chinese authority. On the first priority, that is fulfilling the right of the cruise, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs have coordinated closely with the relevant authorities to issue, among others, the death certificate of the deceased of the Indonesian crew and to facilitate the claim of their insurance. The second priority is that is on the legal uh, priorities or the investigation or legal effort. I'd like to update you that the Indonesian Criminal Investigation Agency, Bareskrim, has detained three suspects from three companies for alleged fraud and exploitation of the 14 Indonesian crews in Long Sin 629. Simultaneously, investigations are underway by the Chinese Ministry of Agriculture as the agency in charge of fisheries issues. Furthermore, communication remains frequent between our embassy in Beijing and the Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs as well as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Indonesia with the Chinese Embassy in Jakarta. On 25th May, our embassy in Beijing received notification from the Chinese MOVA explaining that the remaining two Indonesian crews of Tianyu 8 fishing vessel are safe and healthy in Dalian. As we speak, both are undergoing mandatory 14 days of quarantine before returning home to Indonesia. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs is committed to further facilitate cooperation between Indonesian and Chinese authorities on this matter. So colleagues, I hope that I have answered the question for me. And now I give the floor to Minister Monoarfa, and then after that will be followed by Professor Wiku. Thank you very much once again, Pak Menteri Monoarfa. Kami persilakan. I only have two questions. This is my lucky day. Uh, question number one is from uh, Channel uh, News Asia. How has the COVID-19 affected plans to move? Yes, this is the very popular to the new capital in East Kalimantan. Are the plans still on track or not? Yeah. COVID-19 pandemic is a global issue and currently the government is seriously working to tackle the impact of COVID-19 on health, the economic and other aspects of life. This seriousness is also reflected in the government's effort to adjust the state budget from all ministries and institutions, not to mention for the new capital city project. We are still in the stage of deepening the plan and strategies for the new capital movement. The activities include the preparation of master plan, special plan, and development strategies, include the capital city authority agency and the law and the, on the new capital. The activities are undertaken in the form of analysis, study, planning, and coordination among line ministries, local government, and other stakeholders. The physical construction are yet to be started in this year. To great extent, the COVID pandemic, of course, has affected our development targets and priorities. This also challenged the preparation of new capital city. Therefore, all planning and strategies are being developed 
comprehensively and in accordance with the new dynamic of the pandemic. Basically, activities that are not crucial can be postponed. Physical projects on the new capital, new capital will not be implemented this year. Similarly, several targets in our national priority project are likely to experience delays from the initial schedule. Question number two is from ABC. What is the timeline for Indonesia reopening the, its economy and returning to a new normal? When does it envisage the, this happening? And how does Bali fit into this? Will it be much earlier? Some reports suggest Bali will reopen for business in some areas at least by Julie. In general, the plan for reopening economy and entering into a new normal condition will be conducted in stage and will be determined based on a comp comprehensive measurement to three main criteria as I explained. First, epidemiological criterion represented by effective reproduction number that less than one. RV is the average number of secondary cases per infectious case in population. If RT is less than one, there will be a decline in the number of cases. It is safe to consider reopening the economy. And if we can maintain the RT below one for at least two consecutive weeks. The second criterion is the capacity of healthcare system. In treating COVID patients, indicated by the capacity of hospital beds and medical emergency facilities that could exceed the number of new cases requiring hospitalization. The third criterion is surveillance capacity, indicated by sufficient swap, swap tests with the capacity of tests that reach 20,000 per 1 million population, hopefully. Even so, COVID protocols should be strictly implemented. All districts and cities are also required to increase the COVID-19 testing ratio, work together with the health institution to handle, trace, and manage new cases, work together with the industries and implementing the health protocol and educate the population and workforce about a new standard of living and working. Bali has shown a relatively low COVID cases. By today, there were 415 positive cases. 302 people recovered and four confirmed that, hence Bali province that that rate is only 1%, lower than national death rate, fatality rate. Bali, Bali government has managed the situation relatively well. We expect the Bali will be ready to, to open for business soon in July. However, opening the economic activity must always follow the new health protocol we are working together with the Bali government to improve the data as basis for taking this decision. In Bali, they have successfully containment efforts. Why? Because they have well-defined leadership like a structure including so-called pecalang, traditional guards. Pecalang and the village leaders work voluntarily in the service of the people. They screen visitors that enter village, prevent large gatherings, monitor quarantine orders, and make sure people follow the COVID protocols, such as wearing masks and washing their hands frequently. Thank you.
good afternoon. Esteemed foreign correspondents of international media, Her Excellency Minister Retno, our Minister of Foreign Affairs, and Pak Suharto Monoarfa, uh, Minister of National Development Planning. I'm here to represent Pak Doni Monardo and the National Task Force for the Acceleration of COVID-19 Mitigation. We would like to extend our Idul Fitri wish to everyone, maaf lahir batin, back to square one, and stay spirited as a champion as we have conquered Ramadan fasting month just a few days ago. Uh, the reborn spirit feeling cleared of your past wrongdoings to others after Idul Fitri is a globalized and universal value that Indonesia Muslim uh, embody. And one thing that we will take from the past Ramadan is as the world's biggest Muslim populated nation, we will have to step into the role of capable partner that other countries need that can successfully cope with the COVID-19 spread. We must overcome this pandemic and come out as champions together. And the spirit will guide our answers to the questions that have been uh, addressed to me from the international media. Ever since the coronavirus emerged as a pandemic, the urge for a single source data integration has been one of the most profound fundamentals. This health crisis shows every nation to push beyond limitations, and one of them is to provide real-time data pooling that is integrated, reliable, and secure. It is the essence of public health. It will impact policies, preparations for health facilities, and impact the way the public conceive the current situation. Indonesia has been developing the system for data integration since March and is facing a lot of challenges. It is not an easy task. The archipelagic nature of this country and being the fourth most populous country on earth is one of the core challenges. Now I would like to answer uh, eight questions from the news media. The first is the question from Bloomberg News. When you or the task force will release data of death among PDP categories, which you promised more than a month ago? Thank you to remember this uh, issue. I would like to respond that we have not yet published the number of the deaths among the PDP categories. I admit that. But those data, alongside the WHO indicators, will be considered as one of the indicators in the measuring the restriction reduction. Health indicators, such as epidemiological indicators, surveillance, and health services, disease progression, and local situations are the focal points of changes in restriction implementations. Therefore, I would like you to not only focus on the number of cases, death, but also consider other data important in releasing the uh, areas. The second question from Kyodo News, CNA. How sure are you that the curve is really flat in certain areas where some regions have not even been conducting mass testing? How many provinces, regencies, and majorities that have met WHO three criteria to relax social restriction. The National Task Force, along with all related ministries, are working together to analyze the data regarding testing capacity of all regions. Uh, since it is not the only criteria for a region to reduce restrictions, we are also focusing on how the trend for other requirements going on in every region, such as number of cases, death, recovers, and hospital treatment in suspect and probable. You may access the data in the website www.covid19.go.id. The public can access the data so that uh, you may see the reality of the data so that everybody can check and then you can analyze so that uh, becoming a responsible citizens. I mentioned earlier this week, the experts team weighed in one an analysis of virus transmission risk 
in combination with other indicators to divide the status into three zones, which are red, yellow, and green. Red indicates the region with high risk of increasing cases. Yellow is moderate and green is low. The latest data show that there are 110 districts that have zero cases of COVID-19, which are classified into green zone. Most of the districts in Indonesia are in the yellow zone, and we will keep our eyes to the curves as a data pillar on future developments. The third uh, question is from Taiwan News Agency and ABC. How is the government responding to the WHO recent decision that suspends the use of hydrochloroquine in its COVID-19 drug trials? The World Health Organization has announced intention to temporarily suspend the hydro hydroxychloroquine arm of its solidarity trial. WHO will provide further announcement regarding the safety assessment of the HCQ and chloroquine usage in the next two weeks. Indonesia is part of the implementation of the solidarity trial. Therefore, Indonesia follow WHO instruction for the chloroquine. The solidarity trial itself is a research coordinated by WHO until now, more than 30 countries have been involved, including Indonesia, by the NIHRD. There are four drugs tested, Remdesivir, Aufia, Alivia, plus interferon, and hydroxychloroquine, compared with the standard of care. Besides that, uh, according to the Ministry of Health, Patient care guidelines published by the five medical professions are continuously assessing the usage of this drug. Smaller doses and shorter duration of administration. Also during this time, it was given for younger age group that had a previously health hurt, hurt examination. At present, the profession continues to use the appropriate protocol and monitors it closely. The fourth question from Mainichi Shimbun. How many people are infected, imported cases, from cluster migrant workers who just returned to Indonesia? In all Indonesia ports, airports, and harbor, officers are taking necessary measures in regards to COVID-19 outbreak. Migrants that return to Indonesia will undergo body temperature check, history, taking related to COVID-19 signs and symptoms, as well as rapid tests. Our international port have been conducting health alert cards for migrants since late January. The arrived passengers will then be identified into three classifications, positive, probable, and patients with no symptoms. The array of examination will then determine whether the individual is to be referred to hospital or quarantine. The officers will also carefully monitor cruise ships' crews in their return to home. In this matter, currently there are 192 positive patients that are quarantined in dormitories and hotels across Jakarta, 31 in the province of Riau Island, and 195 in Bali. The total number is 418 patients. Data conceived from the Sukarno-Hatta Airport rapid test testing show that 361 samples are reactive. I would like to respond to the fifth question from the Sky News, Mainichi Simbun, and CNA. What is the new normal for Indonesia, and do you think it's the right time to start it? other than Jakarta, West Java, Gorontalo, and West Sumatra, are there any plans to use police and army elsewhere to enforce social distancing? A productive and safe new normal is to keep maintaining physical distance, wearing masks, washing hands frequently before touching eyes, nose, and mouth, and avoiding routes to be applied on a daily basis. 
The protocols are also already being published by the Minister of Health to be adopted for each tailored sector of activities and massively socialized to all of the people in Indonesia. A productive and safe new normal will apply first in several provinces which showed an R0 indicator under one. The R0 indicator number below one can be understood that the transmission of the COVID-19 cases are slowing down and tends to be controlled. The President of the Republic of Indonesia emphasized to ensure the level of readiness of each region and provinces in controlling COVID-19 virus transmissions before implementing productive and safe new normal protocol. For provinces that are known to have a high COVID-19 cases transmission, the President ordered specific attention to conduct massive sample testing and tracking followed by strict isolations to suppress the COVID-19 transmission curve. Indonesia National Armed Forces, or TNI, and also police have been deployed to secure and monitor the crowded points area in four provinces and 25 districts regarding the preparations of the implementation of the new normal order. It will expand it in more areas in the implementations is considered effective. The sixth question is from the CNA. The BNPB's particular state of disaster emergency ends on uh, May 29th, and the Mudik ban ends on 31st of May. Will this be extended again? Although the status of the particular state of disaster emergency situation disaster determined by the National Disaster Management Agency ends on May 29, 2020, the status of an emergency is still in force. The status of national disaster has not yet ended. This is due to the regulation set by the President. The status of the non-natural disaster emergency situation will end where there is a presidential decree on the determination of the end on the non-natural disaster status of COVID-19 as a national disaster. Automatically, the status of a state of disaster emergency adjusts to presidential decree 12 of 2020. As long as the presidential decree has not ended, this disaster status is still valid. The National Police and Army are improving guards at checkpoints, especially inland transportation, to withstand surging travelers. Specifically in Jakarta, police and the provincial government have ensured that the homecomers who are already in their hometown will find it difficult to return to Jakarta after Eid because the installation of backflow will be more tightened up. In regard to people mobilizations and Moody, the National Task Force has released a circular letter which addresses the people criteria for limitation of traveling. The seven questions from Al Jazeera. There have been inconsistencies of messages between central and local governments regarding the new normal. For example, opening new malls. Why did this happen? and why it is important that public sites like malls reopen when there is no evidence that the curve is being flattened. Oftentimes, we see that some of the government agendas that receive a lot of scrutiny are being misinterpreted by the public and media. The agenda that the public sees recently as beginning to open malls soon is not completely true. This is part of the precondition so that the public should understand the situation so that when we move forward, we are moving together. It was rather a survey both in malls and in transportation hub MRT to observe the situation closely so that the policies that are the government is about to enact will be, be, will be concordant to the real situations on the ground. 
Adaptation and change of this unfavorable condition is inevitable. Hence, it is a prerequisite to ensure that our communities are ready for the unprecedented adaptations required in the coming days. The work of the adaptation is part of the important nor normal human being, capacity to adapt of the situation. The criteria regarding adjustment in public health and social measures in the context of the COVID-19 is being closely calculated with real data by the National Task Force team along with related government institutions. One thing that the central and local governments both are completely aware of. So the approach is coordination with the top-down and bottom-up approach. The last question from Kyodo News. Do you plan to hold a massive rapid test to people attending the mass Eid Idul Fitri prayer across Aceh? We have seen a significant effort across Aceh in flattening the curve. Aceh province has become one of the regions that has not reported any additional COVID-19 cases since the last few days, and we hope to keep it that way. If you check the data in the website, how the performance of the Aceh, that there are many uh, COVID-19 uh, patients becoming recovered, almost 85%. That is a good uh, performance of an area where they report the data and you can see that their performance. Therefore, we cannot uh, generalize uh, Indonesia as one. We have 514 districts and cities and we, will, we should uh, evaluate the situations based on each area. Community leaders such as religious and local leaders, also other figures, are the key to success in providing a better education and understanding to the community, applying efforts to prevent the transmission of COVID-19. So collaborations will be carried out with various community and religious groups, such as the al Qautsar Mosque in Pamulang. There are massive education is being carried out there through an online media, banner throughout the region, and carry out health protocol appeals using uh, 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 command cars and also ambulance. So to sum up, the collectivity of epide epidemiological data is very imperative for surveillance as reference of indicators for imposing health, social, and economic policies. The transparency is key and also needed to trigger the public survival instinct, to educate them about current condition, henceforth affecting the way people behave and carry out daily activities in this outbreak. Despite the imperfections of the system we are having today, which you see in Indonesia, Indonesia has leaped far compared to where we were two months ago. Hopefully in the days ahead, more and more relevant institutions could affiliate in our system in order to enrich our data input as well as for themselves to avail of it for the integrated data provided will also be beneficial for the institutions involved including for the foreigners who want to visit indonesia in the near future for example the lab involved in our system could alarm if they are about to run out of the reagent. And the system would channel that matter to the relevant institutions directly. Reliable epidemiological data is to impose enactment in the context of the COVID-19. We all agree the data is very imperative to decide the pendulum of adapting to safe and productive life amidst to the pandemic COVID-19. But again, Data collections consist in building data sets with the help of a large group of people. We cannot work alone. There are a source and data suppliers who are out there to enrich our data with relevant, missing, or new information. This is both scientific and aligned with our Gotong Royong spirit because no one is safe until everyone is safe. And thus, Please help me to help you.
Thank you. I would like to return to Ibu Ratna. Well, thank you very much once again, Minister Monoarfa, and thank you very much, Professor Riku. And of course, thank you very much also to you all, colleagues from the media. Inshallah, we will see each other again next week. Stay healthy, stay strong, and stay united. Till next week. <laughs>